was into a lot of stuff like you know English stuff like I was into the Smiths I was into Joy Division I was into uh, you know Echo and the Bunnymen and and all that kind of stuff that was happening and you know I was into REM I was into American like college rock and stuff like that as well like I was I was really into music so if something got a good review I would want to check it out you know mm -hmm. but I thought I was into U2 you know early on and all the stuff that was really good but once I got to the hardcore scene I was like that stuff sucks like I remember the Smiths came to New York and I didn't even care. I didn't even want to go to the concert, which yeah. I totally regret. But at that point I was like, I was in, I'm into Agnostic Front. I don't care about the Smiths anymore. You know, it was really good. It was like aggressive, powerful, and the messages were very clear and concise. And um, I don't know, it was just a very, and, and totally underground, you know, like people didn't even understand it. It wasn't like punk where you like have a mohawk and everyone's like, oh yeah, you're a punk. Mm -hmm. It was like way more subversive. You know, because people didn't know what the fuck you were into at my high school, you know. And even there was kids at my high school that came off, they were punk, you know, they wore a leather jacket. And they didn't know what I was into because, like, I was into something more subversive than that. And I, I thought that was really cool. How do you think the New York hardcore scene compares to what went on in D.C. prior to that? Uh, D.C. is more... Uh, intellectual and artistic I think than the New York scene the, the New York scene is, is more like street like I think of AF guys like I think those guys like yeah, I don't really this is my mythology of them but I think a lot of those guys were like you know runaways and had you know fucked up home situ family situations and and uh, you know maybe broken homes that's like the impression that I got um, you know and, and I'm from broken home too but I, you know I thought these people were a little tougher than me um, I think the DC scene was, from my perception, more like kids from good homes. You know, the music's a little smarter, a little more um, highbrow. Um, and I was inspired by that, totally. So I related to both. At what point did the scene resonate beyond just that area, that tri-state area? Once the records started coming out, because then uh, it was traveling everywhere. You know, even to California, where we would like be able to play California. Um, and or in Connecticut and in Boston. So it started to spread out to those areas and it was just as the records came out then people could get into it. The first thing that came out was Revelation put out this thing called uh, Together, Together Compilation. And uh, I think Youth Today had a seven inch out, AF obviously had a record out, but there weren't that many records. But when this compilation came out, it introduced like I think seven bands that uh, weren't famous, you know what I mean? And Grilled Biscuits was one of them. and. Youth Today was on it as well. And uh, being in Gorilla Biscuits, having the one song on that compilation, the next time we played, it was like a totally different thing. Like everyone knew the words to every, every well, not really had one song, but everyone knew the words to that song. And it was like the whole crowd was anticipating hearing it. And, um, and it was a bigger crowd. And uh, then Revelation put out another record and then another one. And then there was, it just, uh, I think probably within a year, there was probably four or five records that had come out and, uh, and another compilation, a larger compilation. So all these different bands had a little something to run on mm -hmm. and so um, and could potentially be the next big thing, you know what I mean, at CB's. And, um, and there are a lot of good bands. Like there's so many that were actually really, really good. So um, I don't know, it's like when you play tennis with someone that's good. I mean, not that I play tennis, but you know your game goes up. So everyone was really on to something and because they were all good, you got good. I, that's how I took it. When Quicksand formed, where were bands like Agnostic Front at that point? Agnostic Front by that time had already done like Cause for Alarm. They had kind of like branched off into metal and I think the hardcore scene was kind of, had that blast that I was talking about, that mm -hmm. excitement had kind of run its course a little bit and there's a lot of violence. And um, Agnostic Front are kind of an institution and I think they were kind of heading towards that Thing, where if there's a, they were the biggest band in the genre, um, but I don't know that they were. Uh, there was a lot of bands underneath them that were like doing more cutting edge shit, and I think. Um, I guess with a lot of hardcore bands, there that you got as big as you could be in the hardcore scene, and then you didn't know where to go. So a lot of them started to appeal towards metal, stuff. So Quicksand was kind of uh, some sort of. I guess I was really into like uh, like Public Enemy and stuff like that, but at the same time I was into Danzig and like 
Soundgarden and things like that, like, um, uh, and the power of just like hardcore shit, you know what I mean? Taking those things, mixing them, and try to come up with something that would be like powerful in, a, in, in the way that, har- in, a, in, a, in a, as, as powerful as hardcore, but have some other kind of thing. And like, I loved Blast too. Around that time, it just had gotten stale. Like, the whole straight edge thing was too homogeneous, and the, um, the other side of it was like the thug element. I just I don't I didn't have any any um, place in it. What were your visions with Quicksand then? You said um, you were onto something. You felt like you were onto something. I fresh. wanted to just make something really cool that would be sort of breathe new life into the scene in some way. There was a movement to going to uh, this club called ABC No Rio in New York, where it used to be CBs, and so ABC No Rio was CBs had gotten too violent. And a lot of the bands in hardcore had taken on, like, you know, signing to, like, sort of fake major labels. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because it just there was no place to go. And so uh, the reaction to that was to do this ABC No Rio thing, and I thought that that was pretty cool. But I didn't, it was sort of a, a refuge for the nerds. But I wanted to do something that was still powerful, but kind of like how, and Fugazi was definitely a huge influence as well. Mm-hmm. So I guess Fugazi were doing something with hardcore and, and mixing elements into it that had the same power but was in a different feeling. And, I, and that was very inspiring me. They were definitely ahead of the game. Yeah. I think. So that, that was definitely a huge influence. I don't think Quicksand sounds so much like Fugazi, but in terms of like trying to take the New York sound and do something different with it, that sort of was an, an inspiration too. But there was no bigger plan than to just make something really cool. And, and of course, like I wanted people to hear it and be into it. You know? When did bands like Deftones come into play? I know you guys have you've toured. Deftones, I remember Deftones just being like, uh, Quicksand was actually headlined the first Warp Tour. People don't know this, but we were the, the headlining I, I band. I did not know yeah, that. That's so the crazy. Warp Tour is like a big, everything knows better than Warp. Holy Quicksand shit, headlined the first nuts. one. So I remember Deftones just being, you know, hearing them in the distance in some like shed. You know, because there was like the shitty sub stages, and Deftones were one of the bands on then. I just thought they sounded like kind of like a Rage Against the Machine mm-hmm. type of thing, and I, I didn't really think too much of it or check it out too much until Quicksand broken up, and then Deftones. I heard about Deftones more, and they invited us to go on tour, and then I saw them, and I was like, "Fuck, man!" You know, we we can't. It's like I'm done with heavy music. These guys are taking it to another. You know, in my mind, what Quicksand might have done or become they were doing and uh, and that was amazing to be around so I, I think that they kind of picked up on similar things that Qu- I mean they were fans of quicksand too but I think they mixed other elements and from where they are coming from created something um, you know unique and special you know I got to get back to the first warp tour uh, mm-hmm. how did that happen did you know Kevin Lyman uh, the way I, I remember it was our manager at the time Scott McGee got together with Kevin Lyman and uh, to make this festival involving Vans. I'm pretty sure Vans were involved early on. Vans might not have been the main sponsor, but I think they probably were. And, uh, you know, Vans isn't, wasn't what it was then, what it is now, but it was still a pretty big company. So, they, you know, Lollapalooza was happening. Lollapalooza didn't want quicksand. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like they had Nine Inch Nails. They weren't, we couldn't get on Lollapalooza. We weren't invited. So this was a way for us to like ha- be on a festival. So that's how we ended up being the headliner. And Orange Nine were on it, and Sick of It All. It was a very New York. It was it was almost equal parts more New York than it was West Coast. Uh, that year, Sublime were on it. No Doubt were on it from the West Coast. Um, no use for a name. Some of the punk bands. Uh, but yeah, that's how we. And L Seven was the other band. Like the. Uh, they were built beneath us, actually, which was kind of crazy. So um, that was really uh, just a very, like, into another. from So it was very New York-based that first year. And Civ was on it. Um, so Scott McGee and Kevin Lyman, and that's the guys that I remember, put it together. And, of course, it didn't. It lost a lot of money the first year. They had a lot of buses. The turnouts were, like, in the good ones were you know a couple a few thousand some of them were like not even a thousand people um and uh so you know some of them were just like this is pretty you know low end that year was amazing like but the sublime like i didn't know the fuck sublime were Mm -hmm. and um 
the guy from Sublime. I remember he threw a bottle at this kid, this Italian kid that was a roadie for one of my friends. Like just randomly, a random act of violence, just threw a bottle at him for no fucking reason, like a glass Damn. bottle at his head, just because he was walking by. And so they got kicked off the tour, but then they got invited back because of the West Coast they, they were needed. Um, and so they worked it out, and uh, those dudes got arrested. And it was before No Doubt got really big, but they were big on the West Coast. And um, so it was a, it was a cool. I mean, in retrospect, very interesting thing to be a part of, but at the time I thought like, well, this is kind of a budget Lollapalooza. When you look back on Quicksand now, uh -huh. um, had you had thought that the band would have went off to influence all these other bands? You said Deftones. Uh, I thought we were doing something really good and really special for a period of time, and, um, but I wasn't thinking in terms of what I would influence in the future. There's nothing when you're doing something, you think like, oh, one day, I will be credited as an influence. You yeah. Know? You just want to make the fucked song that rocks, make people mosh, you know, really make some sort of lyric that really is effective. Like say something that is, uh, you know, that's inside of you and get it out. Would Quicksand ever do a show now? Um, I don't think it's likely. We did like a reunion. It is just sort of a disaster. And, uh, you know, when we went out with Deftones. And so we, that was like maybe a year after we'd broken up. And... It was just kind of depressing, and I think we all just said, you know, we don't get along that good. But yeah. I, I do really get along with uh, with the bass player Serge, who's actually in Deftones, and mm -hmm. and uh, but um, you know, I can never rule it out. But I, I I think with my solo stuff and and rival schools and all of these other, you know, I do play in Gorilla Biscuits every once in a while. So that's uh, and you know, I have a daughter and have a lot of shit going on. So it's yeah. not something I'm pursuing. Why rival schools after Quicksand? I was really kind of at a loss. I started after Quicksand, I started another thing called World's Fastest Car and started to get that off the ground and had some some really good songs. And then, I don't know, it was a weird time in the music industry and then it became started to become a weird time for me where I just kind of lost the plot, I think, a little bit and didn't know what to do. Like, I had a support within the band. You know, there was a certain cohesion and then within the scene, but I no longer was really felt like part of a scene or... You know, they didn't have that same kind of template. And um, and the record label was like looking for some sort of hits. And so I was not used to that, you know what I mean? So I, mm -hmm. then I started to get a little fucked by that in my head, you know, thinking like, I have to create something that will be a hit, you know, as opposed to just making my music. And yeah, just lost the plot a little bit. And so eventually the record labels started dropping everyone and they dropped everyone and they got bought out by somebody. And then when it was all said and done, I was just like hanging low. And then they called me and said, we still own your contract. We want you to make a record. So I was kind of like, I had a bunch of demos and stuff. And so I kind of started with a couple of those songs and just called up um, Sam, who had been playing in Civ. And I, I you know, knew we could play with him. And he brought Cash in, who was from Civ as well. And, uh, and then we tried to, you know, a couple of guitar players and eventually Ian, who had recorded a lot of my stuff, uh, a lot of my demos, just joined the band. And it was just, we were sort of out there on our own. So it was just like there was a record contract and an offer to do an album. And then, uh, so there was some of it was stuff that I had previously made up and just taught the band. And then other stuff, you know, we came up with, you know, through jamming and stuff like that and kind of turned it into some songs. And, um, and then we just kind of put it out there. And I think the, um, the American record label, it was on a major label, it was on Island. Uh, you know, they did all right. They put us out on tour and stuff like that, but they didn't really promote it in terms of putting out a single or they didn't push it. But in the UK, they did push it. And we got a single and it was kind of like a minor hit. And um, so we did really well over in Europe and, and the UK. And I think that was the basis of our, you know, beyond being like a band that I think people in the United States who are in the know, some people really dig it and have, you know, you'll see them if you went to the show tonight, they'll be there. Um, and it becomes an influence or something like that. But it never hit like a pop thing or even like where Quicksand was, you know, had a time where we were pretty big in, yeah. in some way, you know, not huge, but uh, had a pretty good national following. Um, Do you feel that there was always a constant struggle? Is there an ongoing struggle? Yeah, totally. Like, I think it's, uh, for me, like, if I've gotten anything out of it, I feel like, um, A, I've gotten to do a lot of fun stuff. You know, I'm always like, or things that I think are cool. I don't know if other people would think, you know, 
that it's cool at all. But I love to travel. I love to meet people. I love to uh, have a, such a variety of experience, and it's provided me that. And I've never had to like work for anyone outside of like the major label. But I haven't had to do. Uh, you know, I had to, I worked in a health food store when I was in grill biscuits for a while, and then at some point, like I didn't have to do that anymore, and I've never had to do that. <laughs> I don't know if that's good, but I, I appreciate those kind of things. But it's always been a struggle creatively to like, there's some sound that I want to hear, or some feeling that I want, and um, trying to catch it. You know what I mean? And occasionally I catch it, and that feels really great. And then as soon as I have that, I kind of want to do it again, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I've done that through different bands and with different collaborators. And um, that's the struggle. And I think it's always like, it's mental, you know what I mean? It's like, there's a reason why I've done it this way. You know, it's not like an intelligent design, but it is the, the path. And I appreciate the cool shit that I've been able to, to to do or gain from that but I'm still on that you know what I mean like I want to make another Rival Schools record to like say something else you know and I'm, my solo album that I'm finishing uh, that I, I'm nearly finished with is like I'm really really pleased with it it's saying something else and if nothing else like that's what my struggle is in this <laughs>